Hi there, this is Johan here. This is a quick starts guide for the Vortex rotary axis where we're going to bring you up to speed on setting up your Vortex rotary axis for carving. Oh, and a quick PSA before we dive in. We're going to use a beta version of G-Sender that we call G-Sender Edge throughout this video. By the time you are watching this video, there may be a different recommended version. So take a look at the video description on which version to download and what are the caveats. As a final step, and regardless of the version of G-Sender you have installed, you'll want to open G-Sender, go to Settings, Rotary, and turn on Display Rotary tab. This will show a new tab on your interface and contains all the features we're going to use throughout this video. Switching from XYZ carving to rotary carving is something that we have done in previous videos, but we still like to show you again here for your easy reference in the future. To switch over, you'll first need to grab your vortex rotary axis and mount it onto the table using six or 10 countersink screws. We're going to line up the tracks with the threaded inserts and we're going to secure the screws using either the included M5 Allen key or the equivalent Imperial Allen key. If you're using the extension track, you're gonna butt it up against the main track and securing it using the four remaining countersink screws. Note that the extension track may misalign with the main track making it hard to slide the tail stock onto the extension track. If that is the case, loosen the four bolts securing the extension piece. Line up the extension piece with the main track by hand before resecuring it. If this doesn't solve the problem, it's time to look at redoing your threaded inserts um, following our previous video. Once your track is fully secured to the wasteboard, you'll want to raise the router in the router holder, like so. This will give it additional clearance. And you will also want to jog the gantry all the way to the back to make sure it's square. We're going to zero the Y axis so that the bit is on top of the rotating axis. To do this, we'll use G-Sender's Y axis alignment tool. And the first step to do this is to jog your bit so that it hovers above the headstock chuck. Next, we'll grab the included Touch Pro cable that comes with every Vortex kit. If you want to reuse the cables from your touch plates, that's fine as well. So we'll plug the Touch Pro cable into the probing ground ports. We'll plug the banana plug into the back of the headstock and we'll attach the magnet to the collet. We'll come into G-Sender and we'll click Y-axis alignment. We'll remove the touch pro cables and now your Y-axis is zeroed and aligned with the rotating axis. The next step is to connect up the vortex rotary axis and to switch over from the Y axis to the A axis. So we'll attach both the motor cable and the limit switch cable to the breakout box. And we'll flip the switch on the breakout box as well as turn on rotary mode in G Sender. We hit OK. And now we can start jogging the A axis. Now that's it, switching to the Vortex. The Vortex comes with an integrated A-axis limit switch, so you can always return to your A-axis zero in the event of a crash or if you have accidentally moved your chuck when tool changing. It's a really great feature, but know that it's only available if you also have limit switches installed on the rest of your long mill. To home the Vortex, it's as simple as going into G-Sender and clicking the home button. With everything connected properly, the Vortex is going to do a little homing dance and it will home itself. 
The Vortex comes with two sets of jaws and a work holding faceplate to give you maximum flexibility to do work holding. The primary set of jaws is great for, hold, uh, for holding round or square stock up to one and a quarter inch in diameter. It also double functions as an expansion jaw. So if you want to hold a piece of PVC piping or the inside of a tumbler for laser work, you'll want to use the primary set of jaws. If you have square or round material that is larger than the capacity of the primary set, you'll want to swap to the secondary set of jaws. To swap between the two sets of jaws, you insert the chuck key and turn counterclockwise until the jaws come loose. You then take the set that you want to swap to. You look for the last digit of the number stamped into the individual jaw pieces and you match and insert them into the keyways that are stamped with the same number. You then turn the chuck key clockwise to close the jaws back up. The jaws may not converge on the first try and if that's the case, you can count the number of jaws that are further away from the center, in this case, three of them. You then hold all four jaw pieces with one hand and loosen the chuck with the other hand until the corresponding number of pieces fall back into place. In this case, three of them. One, two, and three. You then tighten the jaws back up and they should now converge towards the center. You can now mount a larger piece that is up to two and a half inches across. The last work holding option is our little work holding faceplate. This is perfect for if you have material that is either irregular in shape or larger than the capacity of both sets of jaws. Simply mark out the center of the piece of material with a pencil. Make a small divot or pre-drill at the center. Then screw in the faceplate using a one and a quarter inch number six screw through the center, followed by four smaller screws to the side. You can then mount the faceplate with the material to your chuck with the default jaws attached. It's almost always a good idea to support the material you're carving on both sides using the tailstock, but it is especially important for material which is three times longer than its maximum diameter, such as this piece or this piece here. To use the tailstock, you'll want to again mark out the center of the piece of material and make a small divot or pre-drill at the center. After you've mounted the piece of material onto the headstock, you can position the tailstock right up against the end of the piece of material. You can then engage the live center by turning it away from you, trying to line up the tip of the live center with the divot that you created earlier. A few turns is usually sufficient and there's no need to extend the live center by more than an eighth of an inch. Lastly, lock the live center by turning the red knob at the back and give the material a quick shake to make sure it's secure. Once your piece of material is secured onto your vortex, you'll just need to set your zeros. We've already set the Y zero as part of the switchover process previously, so now we'll only need to zero the X, the Z, and the A axis. To zero your X axis, simply jog the bit over until it clears the jaws or the work holding faceplate, and then you click zero X. You'll want to pay attention to not set your X zero so far to the right that you risk crashing it into tailstock when you run your project. This shouldn't really be a problem for most starter projects where you typically leave a lot of material to the sides, but it's something to bear in mind as you progress onto more advanced projects. For the A-axis, you can usually just zero it wherever you want since we're carving around a cylinder, but if you would like to orient your model so that it's facing a certain direction relative to the piece of material, you can rotate it around to where you want the drop to start before clicking zero A. Lastly, the Z-axis. Whereas most of us are used to setting Z-axis zero to the top of your piece of material, for the vast majority of rotary carvings, we actually recommend that you set your Z-axis zero to the center line. 
This is conceptually very similar to setting your z-axis zero on the waste board instead of the top of the material when you're doing XYZ carving. There are some technicalities behind this recommendation, but in broad strokes, this improves the accuracy of your parts and also helps G-Sender visualize the rotary tool paths that you have. To zero your z-axis to the center line, we can use the built-in z-axis rotary probing feature in G-Sender. Simply connect up the touch probe harness, similar to what we did during the switchover, hover the bit atop the chuck, and click probe rotary z-axis. Once probing is finished, your z-axis is now zeroed on the center line. As a final note, you'll want to use this tool to re-zero your z-axis after every tool change, almost like a tool length sensor. In our experience, it's almost always easier to start your project with a properly rounded piece of stock. But in lieu of trees that grow perfectly round lumber, the surfacing tool inside G-Sender should be your best friend. To turn a piece of raw stock like this down to size, we'll start by measuring the largest dimension on the piece. So for a square stock piece like this, it's the corner to corner distance, say around 90 millimeters for this piece. We'll also want to know the size of the piece of round stock that we can get out of it. So we will measure the edge to edge distance and take a little bit more off as a buffer. Say in this particular scenario, 60 millimeters. Lastly, we'll want to measure the length of the material. And in this case, 128 millimeters. Moving over to G-Sender, we'll want to click the rotary surfacing tool underneath the rotary tab. We'll then enter the measurements we've made as parameters, 127 millimeters in length, 90 millimeters in starting diameter, and 60 millimeters in final diameter. And for step down, we'll leave it as 20. We'll also want to check the parameters for the cutting tool. And a quick note is that G-Sender automatically compensates for the feet rate as you cut closer and closer to the center. So there really is no need to speed feet rate up if you're surfacing smaller diameter cylinders. Next, we're gonna click Generate G-Code. Before we run this toolpath, there are a few differences that you should be aware of between our normal surfacing tool and the rotary surfacing tool. First is that instead of just trying to specify how deep you would like to cut, you instead define the size of the piece of material you have and the final dimension that you actually want. This is arguably a little bit more prep work, but it also makes it unnecessary to measure the size of your piece of material after surfacing. And this is a direct benefit of having zeroed your z-axis on the center line. Second is the shape of the toolpath that we're generating. So instead of cutting in a scan line pattern, we cut the material using a helix similar to your kitchen spiralizer. This improves cutting speed and also surface finish by reducing cutting direction changes. One caveat is that the current version of G-Sender just doesn't visualize spiral patterns very well, although it might get changed in the future. The last thing to know is that running helical toolpaths increase A-axis coordinates to some very large value as the piece of material is always turning in the same direction. To keep A-axis coordinates from growing too large, the surfacing tool will sometimes surface half the piece of material in one direction and the other half of the piece of material in the opposing direction, depending on whether you have an odd or even number uh, of step downs. You can also override this behavior by going to G-Sender and clicking on Enable Rehoming, in which G-Sender will always make full spirals across the entire length of the material without direction changes. Although you'll need to rehome after such an operation to clear away any excess A-axis coordinate values. With that out of the way, we can mount our material and assuming that you have zeroed all your axis, click start job. This is a bonus topic for those of you who like running large projects with tool changes. In these types of projects, it's relatively easy to accidentally turn your workpiece and lost your A-axis zero during a tool change. To reduce the chance of this happening, we recommend that you turn on holding current 
so that your motors remain energized and locked even when it's not moved. To turn on holding current, you simply send the command $1 equals to 255 in console and give it a quick jog. Now, your headstock is locked regardless of what you do to it. Your rotary axis along with your X and Z axis motor is now locked and stationary, reducing the chance of any accidental movements when you change tools. To turn off holding current, you simply send the command $1 equals to zero in the console and give it a quick jog. And now your motors are free again. When using holding current, you'll want to be aware of the following caveats. The first is that enabling holding current increases the chance of your motor drivers overheating since power is turned on at all times. So use it sparingly if you're in a hot environment. The second caveat is that you must depress the e-stop when you are using the rotary switch. Otherwise, it might cause damage to your switch. Beyond setting up your Vortex on a long mill, you'll also need to make sure that you have set up VCARF or Aspire properly to generate toolpaths for the Vortex. The first thing you'll need to do, and you'll only need to do this once, is to install the Vortex-specific post-processor. This is crucial for your G-Sender to be able to interpret and visualize any rotary toolpaths that you export. To install the post-processor, you simply go to our resource page linked in the video description, click on Vortex A-axis post-processor, to download the new post-processor file. You then open up vCarve on your computer. You navigate to Machine and click Install Post-Processor. You find the file that we just downloaded and you open it. And now your Vortex post-processor is installed. To use the post-processor, you simply select Vortex A-axis Gerbil the next time you're exporting any rotary toolpaths. And if you open the toolpath in G-Sender, you'll see that it gets recognized as a rotary file. As a pro tip, if your rotary carving is being visualized in G-Sender as a normal flat carving instead of something cylindrical, it's a telltale sign that you haven't selected the Vortex post-processor when exporting your G-code and you'll need to go back to vCarve and re-export it. Since we're on the topic of vCarve, we would also like to remind you to double check that your Z0 position setting in job setup is set to cylinder axis. Again, there are specific scenarios where you want it set to cylinder surface, such as when engraving on a rolling pin. But for the vast majority of cases, we recommend sticking to cylinder axis. As a pro tip, if you have unintentionally set Z0 position to cylinder surface, your model would look like it's been flipped inside out when visualized in G-Sender. If that is the case, don't panic. Just go back to vCarve and change your Z0 position setting. G-Sender should now visualize your toolpaths properly. Thank you for watching the quick start guide for the Vortex rotary axis, and we hope you got something out of it. In the next video, we're going to show you how to make a chess piece. So like, subscribe, and stay tuned.